Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen one more time. And we want to apologize to you that uh, we had no sound at first, but we thank God that God is a fixer. -er. Anybody glad God can fix it? Amen. And so we are grateful for this marvelous experience to stand and declare the word of God on this resurrection Sunday morning. Uh, if you're at home, please grab your Bibles. If you're in the sanctuary, please uh, draw your attention to the Gospel of St. Matthew. Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew uh, chapter number 6. Matthew uh, chapter number 6. The Gospel of St. Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew 28 verse number 6. The Bible says in Matthew 28 verse number 6. He is not here. He has risen. Just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. For the Bible said he is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. I want to talk this morning from the subject. He's not there. Just holler at your neighbor real quick. We're not doing a touch. Reach out and touch somebody. Just say he's not there. That neighbor is not awake. Don't look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm so glad he was not there. God bless us now with preaching power as we shall engage in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. He's not there. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. It was Minister Cat in 1887, 22 years after the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln. His coffin was dug up and opened because there were constant rumors that his body was not in the grave. So they dug it up and the body was still there. The rumors continued to spread and so 14 years later, they decided, Dr. Roots, to open the grave again. Both times, witnesses were present who testified that Lincoln remains were still in the grave. Three days after the death of Jesus Christ, similar rumors began to spread throughout the land of Israel. Only this time, there were no witnesses who could say that they had seen his body. In fact, to the contrary, many witnesses claim to have seen him outside of the grave and even talk with him after the resurrection. As great as a man as Lincoln was, there were witnesses to prove that he was still in the grave. If one of the presidents or any other leader in our government were to cry out today to Lincoln for help, there would be no response. If a scientist were to cry out to Einstein for help, there would be empty response. If someone were to call on Muhammad, Buddha, or Gandhi today, there would be no help. But is there anybody glad that if you were to call out to Jesus Christ, there's instant power available to all of us. Power to change lives, transform, revolutionize, to heal, and to help, and to deliver God's children. Why? Because he lives. The journey recorded in our text represented a customary visit to the cemetery. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene married the mother of James and Salome. They brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint his body. John caught a glimpse of the women as they made their way through the early morning darkness. When it was yet dark, the Bible says, Mark reported their concern, having overheard the conversation as they walked and talked. Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? The whole purpose of this customary visit to the tomb was frustrated by unexpected events. 
there were no thought in the mind of the women but to attend a lifeless body. The present with which they brought sweet spices was a gift of the dead. They were so sure that he was yet dead that when they found the empty tomb, they insisted they be given the location of another new tomb. They said, as a matter of fact, the Bible records, they said, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. The disciples were no more optimistic than the women. The seemingly incredible story of the women was unbelievable, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believe not. Let's always, if you will, this morning, keep in mind that the disciples never expected the resurrection. They were the first who had to be convinced. It were, if we were to examine and cross-examine the whole company of the disciples, we would still discover that none of them entertained the faintest idea of a bodily resurrection of a crucified master. When Mary Magdalene, who left the tomb, hastily found the disciples, they were weeping and mourning as if the loss they had suffered were permanent. Cleophas, one of the two whom Jesus met on a road between Jerusalem and Emmaus, Desiree talked about Jesus in the past tense. For the Bible says in Luke 24, 21, but we hope that it had been he which should have been redeemed, which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all of this, today is the third day since these things were done. Cleopas was already growing impatient with the promise of Christ to rebuild the temple in three days. We began, as the text suggests, with the customary visit to the cemetery. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, here we have Deacon Vernon come, Mary Magdalene, and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. But this ordinary trip to the tomb precipitated a chain of events which stretched across the centuries. The events of that Easter morning completely revolutionized the thinking of the followers of Jesus and wiped away all their tears and quieted their fears and generated new hope and instilled in them a strange boldness which they never known before. They looked had stark, startling, and refutable facts. No one swept them off of their feet by strong, convincing arguments. Michelle, the rapidity with which the events took place left them no time for concoction. It had been only three days since Jesus had cried out with a loud voice and yielded up the ghost. These three days, these three days had been spent in sorrow and sadness, grief and regret, bewilderment and vexation which brought about the totality of the recent events. They replayed the events of that awful Thursday in the garden called Gethsemane when Jesus rising from prayer and walking a short distance to where his disciples were was greeted with a kiss by Judas and one of the twelve disciples. He also recorded and they recall who had, the one who came with the great multitude of soldiers Judas bearing swords and staves and many of the chief priests and elders came to hand Jesus over. They remembered how the soldiers had laid hold of him and led him away to Caiaphas the high priest and after a night of persecution they remembered Russell when they had bound him they led him away whipped him and tortured him abused him and delivered him to Pontius Pilate the governor Jesus was put through a tumultuous, a tumultuous trial unmerciful scourging being stripped uh, crowned with thorns spit upon smitten and then led to a place called Calvary where he was crucified for you and I 
also. They were also looking at the fact that Joseph of Arimathea buried him in his own personal cough tomb. And now we visit the tomb with the women in the text today. And we make a startling discovery. Think about it. They had to rehearse all of that. They're thinking about everything that he's gone through. But today in the text we find that these women have made a startling discovery. We're concerned with the history at this point. We simply want to know was the tomb of Jesus occupied or empty when the women arrived? If the lifeless body of Jesus was still there. We should cancel if Jesus' body was still there. We should cancel all Easter celebration. We would have no reason for triumphant preaching or profound faith. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain and our faith is vain also. But on the other hand, if the tomb was empty, we have both abundant and credible testimony to that effect. We have sound and even obligatory reason to celebrate Easter and sing our resurrection hymn. If Jesus is alive, we have reason to show up on Sunday morning and gather as saints of God and glorify Jesus because he is alive. But if he's still in the grave, our shall shall our celebration will be in vain our shouting will be in vain but is there anybody glad that Jesus is not dead he is alive Matter of fact, according to the record, the rocket terrain in the vicinity of Jerusalem was violently shaken by an earthquake. One of the special attendants at the throne of God was dispatched to the tomb. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment as white as snow. The gods at the tomb were so awe-stricken that they trembled with fear and became as dead men. They went back to the chief priest and reported the astounding resurrection giving details of all the things that were done these gods had no sympathy for the movement that Jesus had sponsored. Genova, they couldn't handle what was going on now. As a matter of fact, they were struck, they were struck by awe of the mere fact that what they was guarding is no longer in need of the begun. They were simply reporting when they went back the facts of the shocking Sunday morning no news. Can y'all imagine this morning with your sanctified imagination how they were trying to come up with the facts on their way back to try to concoct the story that will be a contradiction to the reality. They had to give a report of the news on that Sunday morning that some kind of way somebody took the body or somebody stole the body or he didn't get up from the dead. And it didn't take much money to convince them to recant their story, to declare that they are giving some fake news. They chant that they chant Change their story after receiving a lucrative bribe. They allowed money to take away the power of the story. So their own testimony disqualifies them as a witness to the event. For they said, listen to what they said. They said, y'all, we were asleep. We don't know what happened that night, that morning. We fell asleep. We were asleep. We were in a deep dream. We just don't know what happened. Listen to them. And for some of us, God has done some amazing things and awesome things. And your testimony ought not be concocted around some story that takes the power out of God's blessing. As a matter of fact, you are to be willing to testify yeah God been good to you God made a way God brought you God resuscitated you God resurrected you is there anybody here that's not going to allow any bribe or anything take away from the power of God's resurrection in your life is there anybody glad that you were down and the Lord picked you up is there anybody glad that you were in and the Lord brought you out is there anybody glad that you were crying and God turned your cry into a shout and this morning I'm not going to allow anything to warp the reality of if God has been good to you I don't mind telling somebody what the Lord has done they said 
Notice now, the text said they said we were asleep. But here we see friends of Jesus arrive. Notice now, everybody there want his friend. The text says, notice now, they disqualified the testimony and they take the witness, the power of their witness and dilute it over being received, over receiving some change that take away from the substance of the story. But I'm so glad that we see the friends of Jesus showing up at the burial site. Intimate friends who knew Jesus so well that they could not have been a mistake in his identity. The joy with which these women told their story adds to its credibility. Ordinary friends and loved ones leave the cemetery with heaven heart. But these early visitors look at the empty tomb. The early folk at the cemetery they left with burden and broken hearts. But these two early visitors look at the empty tomb and departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy. And they did run to the disciples and gave them a word from the cemetery. Upon hearing the news, Peter and John engaged the foot race and on their way, Russell Peter lost the race, but when he did arrive, he made a careful inspection. He went into the sepulcher and see if the linen clothes lie, and then he looked around and saw the napkin that was about his head. It was not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Y'all see that this morning? That's enough to make you shout right there, because you do know when you die, and they lay you out in the coffin they put a napkin over your face and they cover your face and then they close the top on the casket but notice when Peter looks around in the coffin in the cemetery he noticed the napkin that was on his face was separate from the clothes the napkin was laying over in a place by itself and so here we find credible testimonies from Mary Magdalene and the other Mary Salome, John and Peter who insisted they found the tomb empty but they are not the only ones we can look for confirmation and authentication there was also if you will some heavenly messages who showed up whose veracity we dare not question said listen to those brothers and sisters those, those heavenly angels those persons who've been hanging out with God came out of, out of nowhere into somewhere and gave a report on that awesome resurrection Sunday morning guess what God set this thing up good he said if you don't believe Salome John and Peter and if you don't believe the evidence from the testimony of the napkin and the clothes I'm going to send you some heavenly messages who veracity we did not the question and they said guess what y'all I know y'all came to see Mary's baby around in a weary land I know you came to see who can peace, peace, who can speak peace to the storm I know you came to see the one who got power to walk on water but I just served notice I know you want to see the one that was hung on that old rugged cross who died and was buried but I got news for you he's not there somebody ought to shout he's not there for he is risen as he said he would listen to that powerful testimony from the angels they said I know who you came to see but he is not there he has risen just as he said and the angel said y'all come see the place where the Lord lay they continued the conversation with the women why seek ye the living amongst the dead these heavenly messes who superintended the resurrection were the only eyewitness they said that the tomb was empty now the empty tomb poses some difficult questions I said the empty tomb poses some difficult questions Dickens Kim have this particular tomb been recently occupied in order to set the record straight perhaps we should turn the calendar back three days to a certain Friday about the ninth hour and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice he said father into my hands I into thy hands I commend my spirit having said thus far the Bible said he gave up the ghost and Joseph of Arimathea buried him in his tomb the chief priest and the Pharisees secured a mandate from Pilate to seal the tomb and set the guards around it Mary Magdalene and the other Mary watched the entire burial 
Thus we settle once and for all the fact that Jesus was in the tomb. Then uh, some may pose the question, was Jesus dead when the body was taken down from the cross? You know, people always trying to figure out really what's the real deal and tell the real story. There was a post-mortem conducted at the spot of the crucifixion, which is recorded in the scripture. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced him in his side and forthwith came there out blood and water to say that the centurion Satimian and his crew were mistaken would be a gross insult to their intelligence. Both the chief priest and Pilate seemed satisfied with the death certificate issued by the Satimian. They were happy. I'm sure he was glad to sign that death certificate because the mere fact that Jesus that they wanted dead was dead. No one at the sight of the crucifixion entertained any doubts concerning the certainty of Christ's death. Even nature expressed her disgust as he gave up the ghost. Can I tell you, nature began to do some amazing things. The sun was veiled in the garments of ebony. The veil of the temple torn asunder. The mountains began to shiver and their rocky ribs crumbled as if they had been blasted. Then one might pose another question about doubting the death, the resurrection and death of Jesus Christ. And that last person was the grave itself. Y'all got it. The last person that posed a question and that probably was the grave. And the confirmation comes again from the scripture. And that was the same tomb where they mourn on Friday afternoon. And there was Mary Magdalene and Mary and sitting over against the sepulcher. It was the property of Joseph Ramathia. It was a tomb around which a God had been stationed and the linen clothes that wrapped about his body and the napkin which had placed about his head were in this tomb. It was the same tomb that they had sealed on Friday afternoon. And some pundits might ask Naomi, was the event physically possible we must admit this afternoon that when the temperature of the body has sunk to a certain point and the cadaverous color and the stiffening of the muscles has been well established and physical life is no longer possible in other words once rigor mortar set in and the blood had been taken out of the veins and there is no oxygen in the lungs and no air moving through the body that means there's no life in the body and guess what physiology biology biotics and anatomy ecology and evolution biology and all human expands all content that resuscitation of a dead body is physically impossible I tell you after being there out for three days you can't tell me that he can live again and that's how we are God y'all is when God is getting ready to do something amazing or God does something amazing in our lives then we try to figure out how did it get done we go to the scientists we go to all kinds of specialists trying to figure out how this happened but there are some things that God can do man can not do even in our modern day of advanced technology and scientific exploration the ability to resurrect life still invades us how can this happen how can you be dead and then get back up how can you sleep in a tomb for three days and then early on the third day you get back up well can I tell you how it can happen because some of us was in some tomb situations some of us was in some dead cases and and in some dead situation and this morning your story is that one early morning the Lord got me up and that's my story and I'm sticking to it is there anybody here who can say that's my story and I'm sticking to it it won't the doctor it won't the medicine it won't any counselor it was nobody but Jesus 
and we must agree that then that Jesus was in fact dead until of course the God who breathed into a lifeless lump of clay the breath of life chose to raise his dead body and this is the claim of our story and it's the claim of the apostle Paul in the New Testament I'm almost done may the Lord bless you real good and I'm so glad y'all allowed us to gather this morning to celebrate the resurrected Christ I'm so glad I've augured the cases with those who tried to concoct the story and say that this not happened but I'm so glad over in the New Testament Paul gives us some hope for this story Paul says this this Paul gives us some evidence of what life is after death and why we should not fear death because God has it in check and this is the claim of the New Testament this Jesus God raised whereof we all are witnesses the writers of the scriptures account of the resurrection were at first skeptical and slow to believe but after reaching their one final conviction that the resurrection was true they began a worldwide campaign to spread the good news of Jesus Christ human nature seeks to avoid that which it finds hardest to understand shame and the grace persecution torture and martyrdom for telling this story but I wonder, is there anybody here that's going to keep on telling it? Yet the disciples plunged forward in declaration of truth and taught to them by Jesus Christ. Despite lurid prospects of the inevitable of their own death, despite the threatening clouds of their own crucifixion, despite the repeated warnings of organized re religion or oppressive hand of a man who just won't tell the truth, the powers to be that they didn't stop the gospel from going forth. The, the disciples stood before the multitude on the day of Pentecost and declared this Jesus have God raised we are uh, we all are witnesses with about without a body there can be no resurrection we have looked at the proof of Christ's death and burial it was not the spirit or the soul of Jesus that was buried but it was nothing but his body and we have a testimony and witnesses that the tomb was in fact empty on the first evening Easter Sunday morning but without a body there can be no resurrection tell your neighbor without a body there can be no resurrection the New Testament scripture contends that the body with scars on his hand and feet raised wealth from the scourge of the whip, torn temples from the crown of thorns, and a wounded side from the soldier's spear, rose from the grave early the first day of the week, early on Sunday morning. But we have also in the text, Doubting Thomas who came upon Jesus and insisted that he touch Christ's wound flesh before he was believe in the resurrection and we do have the multitude of witnesses at the ascension of Jesus Christ who heard his final orders to go out into the world and preach and teach the gospel and telling and sharing the good news the same multitude who witnessed Christ's bodily ascension into the heavens so what do we know about Christ's crucifixion and what do we know about the crucifixion fiction of our Lord what do we know about what Jesus went through well I just want to tell you this and I'll take my seat because I know y'all have raised the same question what is it about the resurrection what is it about dying on Friday and what is it about sleeping in a grave on Saturday and what is it about early Sunday morning we know that God intervened somebody ought to shout God intervene an earthquake shook the foundation of the world God intervened and an angel of the Lord rolled the stone away somebody shout God intervene and the disciples declared without blushing that God brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ somebody shout God intervene and the miracle was wrought on Calvary and every soul that believes God intervened an empty tomb stand as the resounding testimony of the power of God. Somebody shout God intervene from death 
to birth and from birth to death from one miracle to another miracle God in his infinite wisdom and power orchestrated a well designed plan to save you and to save me and that's why this morning we say in the words of Apostle Paul death is swallowed up in victory oh death where is thy sting oh grave where is thy victory because he lives we can live also somebody shout you can live in spite of where you are you can live in spite of what you're dealing with you can live in spite of how you feel this morning somebody shout you can live in spite of what they say about you you can live in spite of what the doctor may have said you can live in spite of how frustrated you've been you can live and this morning you ought to text somebody or tell somebody that in spite of the pandemic you can live in spite of COVID-19 you can live because he lives and because he lives I'm gonna shout this morning because he lives I'm going to give him the praise. And because he lives, I can live as well. Somebody tell somebody I can live because God intervened. And because God intervened, I'm still standing. Because God intervened, I'm still in my right mind. Because God intervened, I'm still standing in spite of what I've been through. Because God intervened, I made up my mind that on this road, Resurrection Sunday. I'm going to give God my best praise. Is there anybody here? I said, is there anybody there? Is there anybody in here? Is there anybody watching us? Or is there anybody out there that want to help me close on this Sunday this morning and shout because God intervened. I almost lost it, but God intervened. I almost gave up, but God intervened. I almost threw the towel in, but God intervened. I almost took my life, but God intervened. I almost quit my job, but God intervened. I almost, I'm, I don't look like what I've been through because God intervened. And because God intervened, I said, because God intervened, I said, because God intervened, I'm stronger this morning because God intervened. I'm wiser this morning because God intervened. I'm happier this morning because God intervened. I'm shouting this morning. I'm praising this morning. I'm giving him the glory. See it. I said, see it. Is there anybody here? Say, I'm going to praise him this morning because he got up. And because he got up, I'm going to lift him up. See it. See it. Because he's been good. And because he's been so good, I got to let him thank you. I got to give him praise. See it. See it. I know he's all right. See it. Is there anybody here that want to shout this morning? See it. See it. He's worthy. I said he's worthy. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the sand. Because can't nobody... I said, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? In the words of Roscoe Cooper. See See This morning, somebody ought to rejoice and shout.
because he lives. You can live as well because he lives in you now. And because he has taken residence in each of us. Don't worry about the report. We're not concerned about what they may say or how they try to fix the story to discredit the power. I know God is a resurrecting God because I was once down. And the Lord picked me up and brought me out of darkness into a marvelous light. And when the Lord picks you up, there's nothing like it. Sometimes I say I'm, never gonna, I'm not going to tell nobody. But it's been so good. Because God intervened and turned that story into a testimony. Somebody watching us this morning, you, you want to try that Jesus. You want to try that Jesus. We invite you to call us, text us, send a message, instant message. Or even if you're watching on Facebook Live or if you're watching on live stream, you can text, send a message. I want Jesus in my life. If you want to be a part of this congregation through virtual worship, we're not going to let just because you can't come in the building and stop you from coming to Jesus. We're going to allow you to come to Jesus because you can't come in the building. Because I want you to know this is just the building. But the church is the body. It's the people. Wherever you are, won't you come? Just, just give us a call. Give us a message. We invite you. We invite you to come. Don't delay it. We're living in some crucial times. People are dying daily. I've never seen so many people die in my life. From the pulpit to the street. But one thing I know, if you know Jesus, death is just the doorway to eternity. If you know Jesus, if you have a relationship today, if you want to be a part of this congregation, maybe you want to rededicate your life, you want to start all over. I want you to know God is a forgiving God. He will forgive you for your sins. We invite you, we invite you. We invite you to come and be a part. Join First African Baptist Church, Richmond, Virginia. Virtual worship. Become a virtual church member. You don't have to live in Richmond to be a part of our church. Wherever you are, you can say yes to Jesus. Today is the day. Somebody asked me, why do you preach like that and get so excited? Let me tell you, I do it because one day, one day, God intervened. One day, he, he showed up. 1986, 1978. I can recall every day that God got me out of a dying situation. He intervened. That's why I love him so much, and you ought to love him too, because you ought to have some special dates that God intervened. That God got in it, a dead, dying, dreadful situation, and he delivered you from it. And, and your story is, I live because he lives. I'm here because, not because I've been so good and so kind or so faithful, but I'm here because of God's amazing grace and his marvelous mercy. That's why I'm here. Please reach out to us if you want to become a member 
But if you want special prayer, just send the message this morning. Send the message for special prayer in the message. We're going to pray for you. We want to pray, and then we're going to have communion. We're going to pray, then we're going to have communion, and then we'll give the benediction. I want to pray this morning for all of the families of persons who, who lost loved ones over the past months, in the past weeks, in the past days. We've lost some major generals in the pulpit all over this country. Pastors have succumbed to that dreadful disease, that virus. And then right in our own city this morning, we lost one of the pastors, Bishop Gerald Glenn, we want to pray for he, we want to pray for his family, his wife who's, who's fighting, who's been ill as well. And the Church of God in Christ, they lost one of their major leaders over the past couple of days. And not just preachers, but folk you know, folk you laugh and rub elbows with are gone. And then there are folk in the hospital fighting. Matter of fact, I read the article. I read an article last night on CNN report. And the CNN report, it says, the dying man said, who going to pay for this? As they was hooking him to the ventilator, he's dying. Sound like on Calvary's cross. Who? Who gonna pay for this? In other words, what he was asking was, as y'all hook me to the ventilator to try to save my life, if I die, who gonna pay the bill? And I want to serve notice this morning that, thank God, the bill has already been paid. Jesus has paid it in full. So this morning, if you need special prayer, wherever you are, please just reach out and touch your screen in faith as though you're touching the sanctuary, the altar. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for being God. Father, we're not going to pray long, but we want to thank you for this privilege to come to you. Lord, as we find ourselves living in a crazy season, Lord, we started 2020 with hope and aspirations and we, we had a vision for 2020 being the year. We made plans and positioned ourselves for this and that and only to discover That this year has been stormy. This year has been filled with struggles and so many people have died, Lord, and so many people are sick and so many folk are going through, Lord, but this morning in Jesus' name, Lord, all I can say is, God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, Lord, for the sins of humanity. Lead us and guide us and direct us to, to walk in the right direction, to follow the divine path of you, Lord, and, and help us to understand, to appreciate life and to value friends and family. 
that we don't take life for granted. For your word says life is like a vapor. One minute you're here, the next minute you're gone. God be with those families that's in sorrow today. Remind them, God, that earth have no sorrow. That heaven cannot heal. Them. And God, we are assured for those of us that stayed here that weeping may endure for a night. God, it's been night now for several weeks. It's been night for several months now, but God, you said in the morning, joy will come. Lord, all I want to say to you is help us. Help us. And Lord, it will be a pitiful shame that after you bring us out of this, that, that we go back to the way we were. mumbling and grumbling and griping. Kingdoms, churches can't get along and people. God, help us not to revert, but help us to forge ahead to see what the end's going to be. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we will have our communion. If you're at home and you have your communion cup, I want us to do at this time is to prepare for our Lord's Supper. Let us read our church covenant together. Having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and on the profession of our faith having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit we do now in the presence of God and the assembly most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, <clears throat> to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotions, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk circumspectively in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our encouragement, and exemplary in our portion, to avoid all tattling, backbiting, and excessive anger, to obtain from the sale of and the abuse of intoxicating drinks as a beverage, to be zealous in our uh, kingdom of our Savior. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember one another in prayer, to aid one another in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and Christian courtesy and speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. We moreover engage that when we remove from this place, we will, as soon as possible, Unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. 
And may the God of peace who brought again from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep with the blood of the eternal covenant, even our Lord Jesus makes us perfect in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom we glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. God, as we are about to partake in the Lord's Supper, we ask that you would sanctify the cup, that you would bless the bread, and that you would bless us as we shall partake it. Now, Lord, whether we're in our living rooms, dining rooms, or wherever we are, we ask that you would transform this spiritual moment from a common use to a spiritual. God, as we eat and drink, bless it as we break it and taste it, that your name would be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. We love you, Lord. Thank you for getting up. Thank you for not being there when they came. Thank you for providing the evidence that you're not there. And this morning, we thank you that you sat at the right hand of the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. On that wonderful night, as they gathered with the Lord Jesus Christ, after he had given thanks, he said to the disciples, if you have odds against anybody, get them right before you partake. Apostle Paul said many are sick, many are asleep because they've eaten and drank unworthy. Go to them and ask for forgiveness. And then Jesus said that night, he took the bread. He said, take, eat, this is my body after it was broken. As often as you eat of this bread, do it in remembrance of me. They ate together. In the same manner, he took the cup. He said the cup represents the bloodshed for the New Testament. As often as you drink from this cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he returned. They drank together. And after they supped, they went out to the mountain of Olives, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, on this wonderful and marvelous morning, we don't have a mountain of ours to go to, but we have a mountain of a world to go and spread good news of Jesus Christ. I encourage you this morning, if this word been a blessing to you, sow a seed, give your tithes and offering, be a blessing to First African Baptist Church so that we can continue to be able to be a blessing to you. You can go to Give the Five. You can go online and give now. We encourage you. Or you can text again. We encourage you. 1 804 265 4445. 1 804 265 4445. Give the Five. Or you can mail your gift to 2700 Haynes Avenue, Richmond, Virginia. 23. Two, two, two. Until we meet again, may God be with you. And may heaven smile upon you. And remember, he's not there. God bless you. Thank you all for everything this morning, sound, music, technology, everybody. Thank you all for being here. And may God continue to bless you and be safe. 
Be safe. Make sure you wear your mask. Make sure you wear your mask. Amen. Except that one.